So you've said that uh, a love of music eventually inspired your love of poetry. Um, explain that transition and sort of how you got started uh, writing poems. It's true that a love of music started me writing. I wasn't in a kind of household where the children write poetry. Uh, my parents are very intelligent people, very articulate, but they weren't college educated. And in high school, I was not a good student. My identity was as a musician, saxophone player. And I think a formative experience for me was playing some a high school dance or a wedding or a New Year's Eve party. And I'd be playing with a piano player, drummer, bass player. My breath was the melody. And I looked out in a room of people, they were having a good time. They were dancing. Uh, they weren't saying, God, that kid is a great saxophone player, but they were, it was music. And I liked that very much. Um, it turns out that poetry also is based on breath. For me it is, anyway. I think in some ways I may be a throwback. Uh, the great modernist revolution of T.S. Eliot, William Carlos Williams, Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens, Marianne Moore, those people want to invent new sound, new rhythms, new kinds of line. And uh, I'm a devotee of that. So in writing too, I think about how it's going to sound. What is it like collaborating and, and crossing genres as opposed to working just yourself with an individual sort of vision? I have a way of saying yes to a lot of things. So in 1980, when my friends and I didn't have computers, uh, I got a weird phone call from a man named Ihor Wolosenko. Uh, did I know about interactive computer games? No, I didn't. Uh, had I heard of Zork? No, I hadn't. Uh, did I know about text adventures? No, I didn't. Uh, would I be interested in writing the text for one? Yeah, I said, I might. <laughs> so I went over to the company. They were looking for highbrow authors. They uh, marketed Mind Wheel, which I wrote, uh, as an electronic novel. The package was a hardcover book. And um, I liked doing something different. And I loved getting out of the university setting. Love teaching, love students, like the whole idea of it. In practice, it's not that great a fit for me. So uh, becoming an early computer user, they gave me the, the uh, it's characteristic. This is so long ago, the brand of computer they gave me, it was an Atari. Uh, and uh, similarly, when Todd McOver asked me if I wanted to write the libretto for an opera, uh, did I know much about opera? No, I didn't. I'd seen a few. Um, as the computer people said, he said, well, maybe that's good. You know anything about it. You'll do something different from what's been done before. Whether it's true or not, I can't say. Uh, in contrast to both of those things, in contrast to the libretto and to the computer entertainment, um, and I'm proud of Mind Wheel. You know, I'm always glad books about these things always cite me as like the guy who came before the guy who became before Shakespeare. Um, the jazz is in contrast to that. Reading with these great jazz musicians like Bobby Bradford, Mark Seals, Stan Strickland, uh, I mean, I've had a really great experience with this. Um, that's more like going back to a dream I had when I was in my teens and early 20s, and a pleasure I had of working with other musicians that I thought was over. I'd never have it again. And now it's like something came back to life. And uh, I hope that when I do it, it's not that I'm giving a reading and guys are playing music behind me. I hope we're listening to one another and interacting and that it's musical. As Poet Laureate, you launched the Favor Poem Project um, and about 18,000 people submitted poems. Why then does poetry seem a little less visible in our daily lives than certain other art forms? Poetry is the most intimate and most bodily of all the art forms. In my opinion, it's not an actor reading the poem or a rap artist saying the words or a brilliant genius singer-songwriter or the poet herself or himself giving a very effective reading. As those videos at favoritepoem.org demonstrate, 
at its core, it's about anybody at all wanting to say the words of a poem. Uh, I say, love at the lips was grief as sweet as I could bear, and once that seemed too much, I lived on air that crossed me from sweet things, the flow of was it musk from hidden grapevine springs downhill at dusk. The author's been dead for many decades. My breath, my mouth and tongue, and little bones in your ears, that's his medium. That's the medium for the poem. And it's on a human scale. So um, as often in these things, the strength is also the weakness. It's not on a mass scale. It's inherently, and by its nature, on a human scale. And that's what makes it so powerful. I remember, I'm the most proud uh, I am of any answer I ever gave in an interview is many, many years ago, somebody said to me, you know, uh, Newsweek magazine had an article in which they said poetry was dead. I'm happy to tell you that I said, well, let's have a race. Let's see which dies first, Newsweek or poetry. And we know who's going to win. For me, uh, Boston and Massachusetts are a version of where I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I did spend eight or nine good years in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, near the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I never felt entirely comfortable there the way I do in Boston. People in the Bay Area are all boosters. They say, how do you like the Bay Area? And I found myself saying, uh, I can take it. And in Massachusetts, as in New Jersey, people brag inversely. They say, you think your politicians are corrupt, ours are worse. Or you think this is bad weather, wait until you're in Somerville in August or February. And uh, that, um, what should I call it, kind of working class irony uh, is something I'm comfortable with. And, uh, the neighborhoods, the uh, sensitivity to ethnic groups. I mean, my two older kids went to Berkeley High School, and I'm proud to say they have no sensitivity to uh, surnames. To me, Odiati and Ginsburg and Leary tell you something, and Nigerian, they give you important information. To them and their friends, there's no particular information. My kids used to say, Dad, you're a racist. Because I would say, uh, go to the garage and uh, Talk to, uh, talk to the Italian guy, uh, Freddie, and tell him I sent you. Or I'd say, yeah, my tailor, go to the, uh, I have an Armenian tailor. And they'd say, Dad, what is that? <laughs> and they're probably right. But where I grew up, and in many parts of Boston, um, that's part of the social registration of who people are. And uh, that's amongst the ways that I do like being in Boston. And uh, I think the, uh, the mixture of different kinds of uh, knowledge, highbrow, lowbrow, middlebrow, nobrow, uh, in my work is like my relation to uh, my home state of New Jersey, or let's say my native state of New Jersey and my home state of Massachusetts. What are your feelings on poetry in a sort of political sense, and do politics or social causes inform your work ever? I think to leave out politics or to leave out social awareness, you better be very good at describing the trees or describing your crockery. Because it's leaving out a big part of life. It's like leaving out sex to leave out the political and the social. And usually, if you think you're leaving it out, it means you're just passively accepting it. So it's an important subject or important source of material. On the other hand, as one of the Yiddish poets said, uh, he said, uh, Yiddish poetry must be more than the rhyme department of the Jewish labor movement. And uh, I think that uh, it needs to be there. And uh, you're not just versifying high-minded opinions. And uh, to denounce atrocity, is not interesting. Are there particular causes or um, issues that you continue to come back to, you find? Uh, 
I find myself very interested in the transmission of culture, particularly in a democracy. And uh, I've done, uh, I have an ongoing relation that I've tried to foster between the BU Graduate Creative Writing Program and Boston Arts Academy. Boston Arts Academy is a city of Boston public school. It's not a charter school. It's a public school. And the students audition. They play music or they act or they dance. If they're visual artists, they do an impromptu assignment. And the idea is not fame. It's a much more important idea than that. The idea is that art, which traditionally is taught to the ruling classes, ruling class in this country is the people, supposedly, it's democracy. Art is a way that at the center of human intelligence, a way that you know you can learn. So if you can master an instrument, if you can master a foreign language and learn different accents as an actor, you can learn just about anything. And the idea is that art gives those children a way to focus themselves. And the amazing fact is admissions to the Boston Arts Academy are blind, academic blind. Doesn't matter what your grades are. That school sends something like 90% of the students to some form of higher education. I've been there, I've guest taught there, uh, every semester, two students from my program uh, teach a creative writing elective there. I know it's a great school and that it works. That through devotion to art, the kids learn to cooperate not only with other people, but with the past and the future. They learn to respect their own intelligence. They learn that they have the power to focus and they do well on the MCAS. Uh, poetry is sort of I think a lot of people are exposed to it for the first time in a school setting. Um, and some people fall in love with it right away, but other people are sort of turned off to it or f find it later in life, but having felt it school or academia at whatever level, sort of turn them off to it. Do you f is there sort of a way to, to teach poetry appreciation or writing that maybe is more appeal, or, or why do you think it sort of sets people? I'm afraid that well-meaning teaching well-meaning earnest teaching gives too many people the idea that a poem is primarily a test to see if you can say something smart about it. With all due respect to smart things, that isn't what a poem is. A lot of people think that we encounter poetry first in school. That's not true. We encounter poetry first, those of us who are fortunate, I think a good proportion of people, we encounter poetry when somebody says a nursery rhyme to us or when you sit in your parents' lap and they read Dr. Seuss to you, or when your parents recite Walter Delamere or Edward Lear to you. Uh, the main thing you need to learn about poetry is that it is primarily words that sound good when you say them. Sing, sing, what shall we sing? The cats run away with the pudding string. Do, do, what shall we do? Now she's bitten it quite in two. You don't have to know what the hell a pudding string is to know that it's fun to say, sing, sing, what shall we sing? The cats run away with the pudding string. Do, do, what shall we do? Now she's bitten it quite in two. You feel the pattern. You don't have to think about it. Poetry must begin, like every other form of learning, learning basketball, learning French, learning about New York, learning about Mexican cuisine. You don't begin with interpretations. You begin with an experience. You visit New York. You try to throw a basketball, shoot it through a hoop. You listen to the music. You taste the food. Poetry must begin with an experience of a poem. People analyze and interpret their family all their lives. Even after they die, you'll say to yourself, what did that mean? What was that about? It's not how you become attached to them. So the videos at www.favoritepoemsingular.org, the videos demonstrate that quite dramatically, I think. You see the U.S. Marine with an Hispanic surname read Yeats's politics. You see Pove Chin from the Cambodian immigrant family read Langston Hughes's Minstrel Man. 
and you hear the understanding of the poem in their voice. And they, then they talk a bit about what the poem means to them. You see Seth Rodney, a Jamaican immigrant, read Sylvia Plath's Nick and the Candlestick. And seeing a few of those videos does more for understanding poetry than any lecture I can blah, blah. The truth is that even when you get to be in your 60s and 70s, even when you've published many books, uh, you do your selected poems, uh, you can tell people are starting to treat you a little bit like a grandpa, a process I call yodification. The truth is, the issues were all the same, They're the same as they were when you were starting out. Am I any good? What can I do next? Of what I've done, what do I value? What can I learn? What have I not done yet? Um, it's remarkably similar. You would expect it to change, and I think part of me thought it might change, but I find uh, it doesn't get any easier, and it doesn't get much different trying to make a good work of art. And so, what is next? Do you, are you working on new projects, or? I'm writing poems. I have some new poems. Uh, I am in the last stages of uh, uh, completing an adaptation of uh, Schiller's Wallenstein. It's a trilogy. I'm making a two-act play out of it, so I'm reducing it quite a lot. This was commissioned by the Shakespeare Theater in uh, D.C. Uh, so a few things like that. Newspaper. They make the paper with an invisible grain so you can tear straight down a vertical column. But if you try to tear it crosswise, it rips out of control in jagged scallops and slashes. Here amid the columns is a man who handles search dogs. He says the dogs depend on rewards, but not like the dogs I know, not dog treats, the lab balancing one on his muzzle, trembling and gazing up at you till you say, OK. Then he whips the thing up into the air and snaps it and bolts it. No. What the handler says is that his dogs are trained to find survivors. That's their reward. Finding somebody alive is what they want. And when they try and try and never get it, the dogs get depressed, he says. These dogs are depressed. Yes, what an animal thing depression is. The craving for some redemption is like a thirst. It's in us as we open the morning paper, fresh, fallible, plausible. It says the smoke is mostly not flesh nor paper. First white, the drywall, then darker pulverized steel and granite and marble, and then long smoldering toxic plastic and fiber. How toxic, they don't know, or it doesn't say. In the old days, the printing plant and the paper, meaning the globe, or Herald, or Journal, or Times, were in one building. And the tremendous rolls of newsprint rumbled off the trucks each day. When I was small, one crushed a newsboy's legs. There was a fund for him. I remember his picture accepting a powered wheelchair in the paper. Paper, the bread of Kronos. Titanic time that eats its children, the one-way grain of downward irrevocable channels, the crosswise jumble, darkness innate in things, in the weather, in the boy who beams up at the camera or down at his stumps, in the prisoner who speaks an unknown language so that his captors guess and call him the Chechen the errant granular pulp. In some old stories, 
the servant rises early and fetches the paper. He reads the paper, then gets the iron and presses it flat and smooth to place by the master's breakfast, the skin of days. Antique. I drowned in the fire of having you. I burned in the river of not having you. We lived together for hours in a house of a thousand rooms, and we were parted for a thousand years. Ten minutes ago, we raised our children. They cover the earth and have forgotten that we existed. It was not the illusion of Maya. It was not a ladder to perfection. It was this cold sunlight falling on this warm earth. When I turned, you went to hell. When your ship fled the battle, I followed you and lost the world without regret, but with stormy recriminations. Someday, far down that corridor of horror, the future, someone who buys this picture of you for the frame at a stall in a dwindled city will study your face and decide to harbor it a little while longer from the waters of anonymity and the acids of breath.